I scream, you scream, we all scream. I scream for George Stinney, who at the age of 14 became the youngest person to ever be executed in the United States, if you can call being black in 1944 a person. In school, George enjoyed singing and acting. You know those secretive interests that all homicidal psychopaths creep around in the dark pursuing. And yes, you do detect an air of sarcasm, but sometimes the obvious is oblivious on purpose. Before the bodies were found, Little George volunteered to join the search party, called out to them in a chorus of worry. He didn't care that they were white. He only cared that it was getting dark and they were priceless, especially to those who were of value. Earlier, the girls had asked George and his baby sister if they knew of a good spot for picking flowers. Obviously, this was a good day for hunting. George obliviously shared news of the interaction, but when, gen but when genetics has already left your entire body branded, a hot tip can burn to the bone. I scream for ice cream. I need something to cool me down as I talk about it, as I breathe fire and incinerate old southern courthouses, police stations, execution viewing halls. That damn nigger ball was the one that sent them last. Let's go get his ass. But why lynch an alleged maniac when you can electrocute a convicted murderer? Lynchings don't get defense lawyers voted into office. They grilled him without his parents present fired his father from his job, threatened to fire shots at the family if they didn't fire up a moving truck that night, and then they offered a 14-year-old boy an entire ice cream cone if he would just confess to a double murder. Is that cold or is that cold? Five foot one, 90 pounds. They marched him into the chamber with a Bible in his hand, stacked it and dictionaries in the electric chair so his short frame could reach the only halo they deemed him worthy of wearing. That's a lot of high and mighty books for people with the moral elevation of snake droppings, the lowdown, dirty, church-going judge and jury never tried to set the record straight. They only tried to set records. Three hours for a trial, 30 minutes to come back with a verdict. I've been known to have put more thought into whether or not I should delete an awkward line from a poem, muzzled and muffled. They even smothered the dignity of him voicing his own pain. Four minutes ticked away before they decided his brain matter had cooked enough. Imagine your blood vessels being pumped full of thunder beyond the duration of this poem, drowning in currents that no swimming could conquer. They never looked for a killer. They only sought out blood they couldn't retreat or resist or recant or reason or retaliate or repeat what they had done. On the day of the murders, everyone was hunting for something. The only one who found what they were hunting for was never found, probably trampled more little white daisies, probably was spared by more little dark orchids, because if you are ignorant enough to hate enough, then you too can believe that a tiny kid could crush craniums as if they were carnations. We all scream for ice cream, because George couldn't scream for himself, because we are all burning with questions like, why does bloodlust always seduce those in love with power? And why are we shocked whenever black and brown and red and poor kids are singed by their supposed saviors? Don't choose to be oblivious. It's not an anomaly when some dirty cop or vigilante seizes the opportunity to scrape another dog child off the face of this earth. Isn't it obvious? It's more of an anomaly when they choose not to, but I know which question is squirming in the buckled restraints of your brain. I know which question is trying to leap from the viewing section of your oblivious death chamber gaze. I know which question is making the lights of your heart flicker like a set of eyelids connected to a power plant. Was George ever given his ice cream cone? Did those God-fearing, Post-birth abortionists ever give that little boy what he traded his eternity for? Before they burned him alive, tossed two scoops of Bible ashes into his casket, and thanked God for guiding their intentionally oblivious hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You don't need to stand up. There's no need for a standing ovation. The cameras can't even see you. Please sit down. <laughs> sit down. That poem was written in mid-2013. A year later, a judge vacated the verdict, posthumously clearing George Stinney's name. A few who knew of my poem asked me if it had anything to do with the new verdict. I told them I seriously doubted that. I'd only performed the poem at a few small venues around the country, 
and I've still never gotten around to posting it on my condemned porta potty of a YouTube channel. <laughs> Credit goes to the civil rights attorneys who worked very hard for several years to clear George's name. I do like to play around with the fantasy that some fan told someone who told someone about my poem, and it swayed someone who swayed someone who affected some type of change in the situation. Shit, I can dream. <laughs> I once performed a different anti-capital punishment poem. <laughs> it's kind of a thing with me. And an attorney approached me afterwards saying that he still believed in the death penalty, but he wanted me to know that I had given him some serious things to think about on his drive home. Since then, I've periodically reminded myself and my students that we can never tell how far the ripples of our messages may travel and who they may give a nudge to once they've been heard. Artists have an unquenchable desire to be heard. So we try to deliver our messages with enough urgency to pique the interest of the average audience. And that's a lot. After all, we're competing with the everyday urgency of making rent the urgency of posting pictures of one's kick-ass Cobb salad. <laughs> the universal urgency of getting some. One surefire way we can increase the urgency of our message is to show where it stands in opposition of conflicting messages or institutions or people. We fight the good fight. And everybody loves to watch a good goddamn fight. It's not that we're bad people, it's just that humans are hardwired to take heed to conflict. The early signs of conflict can trigger our fight or flight reflex, possibly save our lives. Conflict not only gets our juices going, but it helps us to develop our preferences, our limitations, our priorities. Conflict is an important catalyst in the human growth process. Growth. We often only recognize it through the joy or pain it causes us. Our skin cells, Hair cells are constantly replicating, well, to a point. <laughs> but when we don't feel the old cells dying off, we don't stop to consider what's happening. Growth is the thing we spend every minute of our lives doing, yet we never master it. We're never finished growing, which also means that we're always in conflict with who we were two hours ago. We grow up, we grow smarter, we grow stronger, we grow down into the ground. And as we grow, we change and or decompose. Change is every unraveling of the cosmos' seemingly infinite mysteries. Change is evolution, rebirth. It allows us to experience the newness of this existence over and over again. There are people in this country right now who are clamoring to change it into what they think it once was. And there are people who are clamoring to change it into what it could be, but everybody wants change. Who goes to watch a movie where the protagonist never needs to dramatically shift to move forward? We need to see change in our art because we need that art to reflect our ever-evolving selves. One might say it's the only way we can find true meaning in art. One might say. Hell, two might even say. <laughs> and that's my only statistic for this talk. Okay, let's recap. Artists use conflict to grab audiences' attention. Once we have it, things need to progress, expand, grow. With growth inevitably comes change, and change is how we update reality. It's how our art remains to be relevant to that reality. I create art that celebrates change, and I feel that if enough artists would do this, the people of this country wouldn't idiotically focus on making it into the oppressive rough draft it used to be. They can aspire to revise it into something more monumental than it has ever been, something only visionaries can perceive. Systems eventually need to be amended. Traditions eventually need to be updated. The good old days were only good for people who mattered to mainstream society. Everyone still does not matter to mainstream society. If you disagree, that's cool. Things are still changing. In about two hours, you'll probably be as bored with yourself as I am with you and need to live a new reality. At that point, the filmmakers, the poets, the singers, the dancers will do what we do best and transport you, transform you, help you to creatively bury the old you. God damn it, I can dream. I can dream enough new dreams for all of us. It's how artists give love to the world and hopefully teach it to love us back. Thank you again. <laughs>